you would flush an interstate love song. Are you ready? Uh, yeah, whatever you want. All right, uh, we're going to get started. Let me uh, thank you all for coming. This was uh, an excellent turnout. We took a gamble with this presentation because it's the end of the semester and people have finals and everything else. But it was also probably the most interesting presentation of the semester. And so I was hoping maybe if we kept this one till the end, uh, people would show up and that seems to have happened. I'd like to introduce our speaker who is hiding in the corner. That's uh, Dr. John Cotton. He's a Dowling uh, graduate, uh, alumni of class of 97. Yep. Uh, and he's a PhD, in, got a PhD in clinical psychology from St. John's University. He's at Stony Brook. Um, he's a clinical psychologist, uh, written a number of, of peer reviewed publications and two books. One which uh, I forgot to bring and can't hold up to you. Uh, for you, it's called Who You Are Essential Questions on the Hitch for the Hitchhiker's Road to Truth, uh, on the Road of Truth. It's a self help book. And then the Z-score book that we're here to uh, talk about today. Um, the Z-score is a standardization uh, metric used in psychological testing. And uh, Dr. Katona is going to argue that we can use the Z-score to settle really important questions like whether or not Barry Bonds was better than Babe Ruth, um, or compare athletes across different eras. If you're like me and you spent your youth having these conversations, it'll be nice to be able to definitively decide who's right and who's wrong. Maybe mean I have nothing left to talk about with my friends, but that's the price that we have to pay to, uh, to know the truth. Uh, so without any further ado, let me introduce Dr. McDonald. Thank you. Thank wow, nice crowd. Uh, thanks so much for all of you. Thank you, Brian, for that great introduction. And thanks so much for all of you for coming today. It's, it's really quite an honor and a pleasure to be here today. I know a lot of times people will say that it's an honor to, to speak at various engagements and presentations like this, but it, it truly is because, talking too loud? No, talk louder. Oh, talk louder? No. Can you guys hear, Can you guys hear me in the back? No? No. All right. Louder. Louder. Talk louder, okay. Uh, <laughs> that's the first time in history that people have actually asked me to talk louder. Usually it's, it's too loud, so. It's, it's really an honor to be here today because Dowling has meant so much to me in my life and it was really here that I began to feel out who I was. I was a student here from 1993 to 1997 and I was on the baseball team for those four years. I had an athletic scholarship and um, real quick I'll just uh, point out Bob Dranoff if you just want to stand for a second was the athletic director during the time that I was here. I was so thankful that he's, he's able to be here today. So if you want to go to the next slide, the down button, no, uh, the keyboard, the down button. No, it's not working. Space button. There you go. Ah, oh, okay. Now, uh, uh, you know what? It's delayed. So. Oh, it's delayed. Okay. So yes. Uh, no. <laughs> All right. You can start with this slide because I don't think. Uh, Elizabeth, yes. youth, are you here? She's here too. Oh, you are. Here. Oh, you're so, I'm so glad. All right, thank you. So now I can go back one. There we go. Okay. Um, my my time here was so special for many reasons, and there were a lot of people who made a special and important impact on my life. But really, one person stands out the most, and that's Dr. Robert Youth, and this is him here. Um, I hope I don't get too emotional talking about Dr. Youth because he meant so much to me and so much of the work that's in this book I first learned when I was a student here in his psychology classes. Dr. Youth um, unfortunately uh, passed away unexpectedly a few years ago and it was a very sad day not only for me but for the whole Dowling community. It would take me hours to tell you all about how much Dr. Youth meant to me. And anyone who's interested afterward, I'd be happy to regale you with stories. But what I'll say right now is that Dr. Youth was someone of immense character who cared passionately about many things, baseball being one of them. He was a Brooklyn Dodger fan, eventually became a Mets fan. But it was his high standards for things that really shaped me not only in my time as a Dowling student but after I left. Even when I was pursuing my PhD and my masters at Stony Brook and uh, <coughs> St. John's respectively, 
every time I would ha every time I was about to hand in a paper or even submit my dissertation, I would think, would this live up to Dr. Youth's standards? And if it didn't, then I wouldn't hand it in. So his impact shaped me far long after I left these halls of Dowling College. And I owe him and his family a debt of gratitude. And Elizabeth, I'm so thankful that you could be here today. It means so much to me. And thank you so much to Cynthia Grossman, who was able to get in contact with Elizabeth and Dr. Youth's family. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Okay. So, um, real quick, uh, I was on the baseball team here for four years, and this is me up here. It's hard to see in the picture, but uh, living proof. And my time on the baseball field was probably not as notable as my time in the classroom. I had some allergies back then that were a little problematic. Um, unfortunately for me, the allergies were to the strike zone. I was a pitcher and often had a hard time finding home plate. Um, Hence, I'm here speaking at this podium rather than on a baseball field right now, but I guess it all worked out for the best. So today is December 7th, a date that shall live in infamy, at least according to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, I bring that up today. Today is 74 years after the attacks on Pearl Harbor, and I bring that up today because it was another date that lives in infamy that really provides uh, the impetus for this talk. Shortly after 9-11, on October 5th, 2001, Barry Bonds set the existing home run record, hitting his 73rd home run of the season. And that event is really what spurred me to be thinking about how we could reanalyze baseball statistics in a new and innovative way. The reason why this is significant is because the, Barry Bonds was breaking a record set by Mark McGuire in 1998, a year that he and Sammy Sosa raced to erase <laughs> Roger Maris' home run record set in 1961. And it's interesting because in 2001 when Bonds broke this record, that meant that the home run record had been broken three times in three years. The previous record set by Roger Maris had stood for nearly 40 years, and now this record was broken for the third time in nearly 30 years. Well, why, why would this, how, how could this be happening? Why was there so much offense in the game? Well, one of the reasons that we now know is that steroid use in baseball was rampant. Another reason is because ballparks were much smaller in this era of baseball than they had ever been. And there were lots of reports of the baseball being wound tighter or more juice. So you put all of these factors together and we saw offensive explosions in baseball that we had never seen before, making us wonder how all of these records and all of the statistics were be, that were being put up could be comparable from era to era. I remember Growing up in the 1980s, Dale Murphy was the standout player of that decade. In that year, in 1984, Dale Murphy hit 36 home runs and led the league. Had he hit those 36 home runs in 2001, he would have finished 22nd in the major leagues. So that was a league-leading performance in 1984. He would have finished 22nd in 2001 when Barry Bonds set his mark. So how can you compare statistics more equitably between eras of baseball history. Well, that's what I came to, that's what I decided I was going to try to investigate. In 2001, I was in my doctoral program at St. John's University, and I was taking my graduate statistics classes, and I was learning more about the z-scores that I first learned about here, and I said, gee, you know, it's interesting, maybe we could use these standardized statistics something like a z-score or percentile to reanalyze baseball statistics throughout history to help put things on a more even playing field. So that brings up the question, well, what the F is a z-score? Now, I'm not being profane when I say that because F in this context is um, the symbol for a mathematical function, but I'm just trying to be cute. So what the F is a z-score? Well, a z-score is a standardized statistic that helps uh, to indicate, helps us to understand how a person's performance on a given measure relates to the average performance on that measure for whatever group of interest we're talking about. 
Z-score, you can kind of think of it as like a gold standard. That when you think about the gold standard as it relates to currency, you have different currencies that are converted to a gold standard so that, so that they're on the same metric so that you can compare them more directly. So a Z-score is sort of like a gold standard in that you can take virtually any measure and, and convert it to a Z-score. And now you can compare things that you previously couldn't compare because they were on different metrics. So one of the main advantages is that you can compare pitching statistics to hitting statistics more directly. And you'll see later in the talk that I'll discuss why that is important. But also, this is important because it makes it easier now to compare statistics across eras of baseball history because each era, as you will see, had various unique factors that either made it more advantageous for pitchers or more advantageous for hitters. And you can't really tell whether these factors um, balanced each other out. But when everything is converted to a z-score, essentially, you'll see that each person's performance is um, converted to a z-score relative to the average performance of that person, uh, of the group from which the person came. Most z-scores, even though in theory z-scores range from negative infinity to positive infinity, in real life, most z-scores are kind of in this middle range where, it's, where you see it says average performance, and that's a range that's between negative two and positive two. The average performance on, on any measure has a z-score of zero, and you see that's the mean here. So when statistics are converted to z-scores, that statistic now has a mean of zero, and on the positive side, scores that have a positive z-score are above the mean. Scores that have a negative z-score are below the mean. So in most cases, it's hard to find performances in the real world where a z-score greater than negative 5 or positive 5 exists. Most exist in this range between positive and negative 2. But there are cases where such exceptional performances exist that they do exceed positive and negative 5, but it is extremely rare and exceptional. Talking about, fat, talking about variables with which we're most familiar, IQ and height, someone with an IQ of 100, which is the average IQ, obviously that uh, yields a z-score of 0 because that's at the mean, that's at the average. However, someone who has a z-score of, of plus 2 that would be equivalent to an IQ of 130, and that's significant enough for a person to be eligible for Mensa, the Society for People in high, with High IQ. So a z-score of plus two is actually a really strong and significant z-score. Like I said, it's enough for someone who has an IQ of a z-score of positive two to get into Mensa. When it comes to height, person of average height, 5'10", that's about as my height, at least when I'm wearing good shoes, uh, has a z-score of zero. Once again, that's the average. Someone Shaquille O'Neal's height, who's seven feet tall, that has a z-score of plus five. So you can see how rare it is to have a z-score in anything of plus five. Most of us probably haven't met a person that is seven feet tall, at least if, unless we're a basketball player. This is another chart with the bell curve here that was from the previous slide, except this is a little bit more detailed. Once again, we have z-scores here and you can see a z-score of zero correlates to the mean. Now, on, under here I put percentile ranks because that's a different type of standardized statistic that other people are more familiar with. You may remember getting your SAT scores back and it would tell you you got a particular score, 1200 or 1130, and then it would tell you your percentile rank. So a percentile rank, what that's really telling us is what percentage of scores or what percentage of people fall below your score. So someone here at the 99.997 percentile, someone with a score that high scored higher than 99.997 of the people who got the same test. Okay? So z-scores and percentiles, for the most part, can be converted back and forth to one another. But the mean here, at the average, the average performance yields a z-score of 0 and a percentile rank of 50. By the way, if anybody has a technical question, please feel free to raise your hand to ask. More theoretical questions or open-ended questions, I'll answer at the end of the talk. But if there's a practical question about understanding something, please you know, raise your hand. I'll be happy to explain it. 
The formula to compute a z-score is actually quite simple. So you take the score of interest. So let's say you got an 83 on a particular exam. You subtract out the mean. Let's say the mean for this particular exam was a 68. Okay, you subtract your score, you subtract the mean from your score, and then you divide by the standard deviation. Standard deviation is a statistic that essentially tells you how far apart scores are in a particular group. I'm not going to go too much into that because that might be a little too technical for this talk, but uh, essentially what we're talking about here is a, a simple quotient of your score of interest minus the average score for the group divided by the standard deviation or the spread of scores. So getting back to this example, one of the reasons, one of the examples that I give in the book to help people conceptualize this is just what I said before. Imagine you take a very difficult exam. You're in Mr. Hardnose's chemistry class. Mr. Hardnose is a really hard grader, hence the name. And your rival, however, is in a different class. He takes the same exam, but he's in Mr. Goodgrade's class. Mr. Goodgrade is a very easy grader. Okay, he basically gives everybody an A just for showing up. Okay, what I'm going to demonstrate to you is that your 83 in Mr. Hardnose's class can actually be more impressive than Jack's 99 in Mr. Goodgrade's class. Well, how could that be? Everybody knows 99 is greater than 83. Well, well, let's get to the next slide. So in your class, okay, here's your 83. And then this, class is, th this slide is a little complicated, so I'll, I'll just go slow with it. Turns out in your class, in Mr. Hardnose's class, the class mean was a 68, which isn't very good. Okay, Mr. Hardnose is a really difficult grader. So your 83, which turns out is the second highest grade in the class, was actually pretty significant relative to the average score here, which was a 68. When we do the calculations, you can see the formula up here. When we do the calculations, we subtract the average 68 from 83, and then we divide by the standard deviation. That yields a z-score of 1.26, which is really quite impressive. Go to the next slide. In contrast, you have Jack, who scored a 99. Okay, but remember, this is Mr. Goodgrade's class, and Mr. Goodgrade is a really easy grader. So, you know, there are one, two, three, four, five, six students in the class who got a higher grade than Jack, who got 100. The average score in Mr. Goodgrade's class was a 93. So, Jack's 99, while it's impressive in absolute terms, relative to the rest of the class is just kind of, eh, it's kind of close to the average. And as you can see, his z-score comes out to 0 0.49. Still higher than the mean, but not by much. So once again, um, this just goes a little bit more into the mathematics of it. Your score of an 83 relative to the class average of a 68 yielded a z-score of 1.26, which is quite impressive. Jack's 99, relative to the average performance of the class 93, yielded a z-score of just 0 0.49. So your 83, in the context of your class, which was very difficult, actually yielded a higher z-score than Jack's 99. Yes? Are you able to say then that uh, the Mr. Hard knows z-score is, is two and a half times as impressive as, as uh, Jack's, or does not scale that way? Um, it, because the z-score is about two and a half times? Yeah. Yes and no. It's a little bit more statistically complicated than that, but essentially, yeah, you could say in the context of those two classes, this grade was two and a half times harder to achieve than that grade was in the other class. So now I'm going to make a transition to baseball. So one of the reasons for this, these analyses that I did is so that we could look at different eras of baseball history. We have uh, Terrence Mann, James Earl Jones' character in Field of Dreams, talking about changes in baseball mirroring changes of life. And this was one of my favorite baseball movies. And so we looked at seven eras of baseball history from 1876 to the present. And in each era, you'll see that there were unique and idiosyncratic factors that made each era very different and the statistics in each era, at least when we're talking about them from a raw score perspective, very different and difficult to compare. Yes, question. Can I just ask a technical question? Sure. Yes, sure. To think about what you're saying. The 99 that the uh, student got, that was the average score, right? Yes. Yeah. So even though it might be statistically significantly different, in practical, if you get 99 right out of 100, meaningless in reality. 
you got every question right. So you have to know the material, and you were able to know the material almost perfectly, then that's great. If you didn't do so well and you only got an 83, which is still good, but it's not outstanding, that means it's material that you don't know. So can you just make sure that you distinguish between what we can do statistically from what it means in reality? Sure. So th that's an excellent point, and this is something that gets brought up a lot, okay? So there is there are two main distinctions in how to evaluate people. One is criteria-based evaluations, whether you met a certain criteria, a cr certain criterion, and the other is relative performance, okay? Both are important. I think to this point, however, we've been more focused on criterion-based learning, and this is something that's important for education, and I know obviously Dowling has a tremendous education program, and that's why this, these types of things are very important. So both are important, criterion-based learning and how a person performs relative to their peers, because on every exam, you're going to have differences in what a professor is going to, especially when you're talking about things like mathematics, when you can give partial credit. Some professors are going to be very hard and strict, and others are going to be very easy, you know, give grades very easily. Yes? Well, when we're talking about the idea of, uh, of assessment, of course, there's criterion referencing, but there's also something called norm referencing, yes. which is where norm referencing is where we're evaluating uh, student work against student work. Exactly. So if there's criteria referencing, there's a specific criteria, such as the one hundred percent that you would get and this ninety nine percent is reflective of a criteria based assessment. Norm based assessment, what you're looking at because the Z score, the purpose of the Z score is to calculate your score with relation to the mean, of course the mean of the class. So yes. you're comparing it to your classmates, not to your ability to understand the content. So that's the difference between criterion reference and norm reference. What's your background? Assessment. Oh okay. <laughs> there you go. I'm glad to have you here. <laughs> yes. Yes. to pit them against the students, but rather to make sure they all learn the material. Right. Their ideal view would be they all get 100. Yeah, okay, so we, you know, this is, a, this is a theoretical question that we'll talk a little bit more at the end. I want to make sure I have time for the material, but these are two different ways of evaluating people, and what I'm saying is I think both are important. In baseball, to this point, relative evaluations have not been made. It's only been an assessment of raw and absolute performance, and we'll see why there are problems with this. Okay, go to the next slide. In the pre-modern era, okay, baseball began as it, uh, with the official start of Major League Baseball in 1876. In the 1870s and 1880s, we had only 70 games per season, okay? So if you're looking at absolute statistics like home run totals, and you're comparing someone who played a 70-game schedule with someone who played a 162-game schedule, well, there's a problem with that. Another problem is you know earlier in that era we had pitchers uh, we had pitching rotations of only two pitchers in a rotation so pitchers were getting many more starts many more chances to acquire victories so that would skew the pitching data on a more technical perspective you have the pitching mound which is much closer to home plate during this year 45 feet away as opposed to 60 feet six inches away and other quirky rules like in this era pitchers were only able to were only allowed to throw underarm sort of submarine okay so different rules that made this you know a little bit quirky as the era progressed things started to progress to the game that we know today the pitching mound was eventually moved back to 60 feet 6 inches uh, the schedule expanded though not to 162 games to 112 games overhand pitching was legalized Although there were other quirks as well. Again, four strikes are needed for an out. We all know, you know, three strikes is, is what's required for a strikeout. And walks were counted as hits. Okay, so that's certainly going to influence batting average statistics as, other, as well as other statistics for pitchers and so on and so forth. Again, later in the era, modern rules start to take effect for, strike, for strikeouts and walks. Three-man rotations start to take over. Now, you know, in the present day, we have five-man rotations. The season eventually expanded to 154 games, which is where it would stay until 1961. And then bat size was allowed to increase uh, as the era went on. Okay. So now this takes us to the dead ball era, and this is really the first era that baseball really as a whole kind of looks like it does now. And the, star, the stars of the dead ball era, people like Babe Ruth and Tris Speaker and Shoeless Joe Jackson played in this era. 1901, you have the birth of the American League. Before this, you only had the National League. Pitching mounds were allowed to be raised to 15 inches higher. 
this gave pitchers a significant advantage, significantly uh, greater advantage. Other quirky rules like runners would have to stop at third base if an outfielder missed the ball but threw his glove and hat at the ball and was able to hit it. Um, we're going to come back to this. Babe Ruth in 1919, the year 1919 is notable in this era for several different reasons. Number one, people remember 1919 as the year that the Chicago White Sox threw the World Series, hence the Black Sox scandal of 1919. 1919 also, Babe Ruth was on the Red Sox and he hit 29 home runs, which doesn't sound a lot by today's standards, but we're going we're gonna to see a little bit later on why that was significant. He did so well for the Red Sox that the Yankees wanted him, and the Yankees, as we see here, purchased Babe Ruth in the offseason for $100,000 and a few loans. And this was, you know, a monumental event in baseball history. Other things that were significant of this era, four-man pitching rotations start to take shape. The balls were heavier and deader, hence the dead ball era. Okay, so it was much harder to hit home runs in this era. And the ballparks were gigantic. They were football fields that were transformed into baseball fields. And in some cases, the average distance from home plate to center field was 490 feet. And that was just the average distance. They were center field fences that were way over 500 feet. I mean, who's hitting a home run over that fence? Well, maybe Babe Ruth, but nobody else, OK? So now we move into the home run era, which is sometimes called the World War II era. Well, we talked about Pearl Harbor before. And Here's a picture of Ted Williams, who was not only one of the greatest baseball players that ever lived, but he was also one of the greatest fighter pilots that our country has ever known. Here we have Jackie Robinson, and of course, one of the most significant things in this era is that the color barrier was broken. And now, for the first time, players of color were allowed to play in baseball, and so the talent pool opened up tremendously. Players from the Negro Leagues were invited in, and right away, players like Satchel Paige and Juan Marichal and Willie Mays were making a big splash. These are players that Babe Ruth never had to play against. And now they're coming and infiltrating the league and making a big splash and doing uh, great things. So this is one significant difference in this era relative to the other eras. Um, some of the other changes that were made, 1958, you know, you start to see ballparks, newer ballparks, um, coming into the league that were a lot smaller, making it easier to hit home runs. Babe Ruth ushered in the era, the home run era. This is 1920. Of course, 1927, Babe Ruth hit 60 home runs, and he set the record that lasted until Roger Maris broke it in 1960, uh, 1961 when he hit 61 home runs. So that record lasted almost 40 years. And then Roger Maris's record lasted almost 40 years. And then in 2001, Barry Bonds breaks a record that lasted only three years. So you could see home run records lasted a long time until the steroid era later. Okay. The expansion era in baseball, you see eight new expansion teams are added in the league between 1961 and 1975. And what that did, many people believe, diluted the level of talent in the league, especially on a pitching level. So you see a lot of quirky statistics in this era. 1961, you have the American League expanding to 162 games. Interestingly, the National League didn't expand to 162 games until the following season, 1962. So there was a season where both the American League and the National League played a different number of games. The National League was playing 154 games in 1961. So again, how do you compare home run totals when people are playing different numbers of games, right? Other things that were notable in this year, 1968, which isn't listed here, was the year of the pitcher. Two pitchers, Bob Gibson and Dave, uh, Danny McLean, not only won the Cy Young Award, but they won the MVP. They posted microscopic ERAs, and because of that, owners decided that they wanted to reintroduce offense into the sport. So they were going to change some of the rules and regulations to make offense, and particularly home runs, uh, more common. So they lowered pitching mounds, they lowered the requirement for pitching mounds from 15 inches to 10 inches, they made the strike zone smaller, and in 1973, the designated hitter was introduced. Once again, not in both leagues, only in the American League. So how can you fairly compare pitching statistics when one league has a designated hitter, essentially an extra cleanup hitter, and the other league doesn't, where the pitcher hits? Free agency era, 1976 to 1985. This is uh, Kurt Flood here, who in 1969, in the previous year, challenged the reserve clause leading to uncertainty about whether players can switch teams or not. For a number of years, there was some confusion about this until 1975. A 
judge ruled that um, Dave McNally and Andy Messersmith would be allowed to play for the highest bidder, thus opening the free agency era. This led to lots of labor problems and eventually the strike in 1981 that almost cost the, the league the World Series and, and uh, the season. Other changes in this era that are notable, relief pitchers are used much greater and you see relief specialists, lefty lefty, um, spe left handed specialists to get out lefty batters, right handed specialists to get out right handed batters, closers coming into the game. So this makes a big difference both on the pitching side of the ledger and the hitting side of the ledger because now late in games you have hitters who are facing a, a relief pitching specialist like Goose Gossage or Raleigh Fingers rather than a tired starting pitcher. So this had an effect on all sorts of statistics. So now we enter the steroid era, the era that really skewed statistics in baseball more than anything else. And this era begins in 1986, which may sound a little early for some people, but 1986 is the year that Jose Canseco won the Rookie of the Year award, and the following year, Mark McGuire won the Rookie of the Year award, both for the Oakland Athletics. And then we now know both McGuire and Sosa were using steroids, and they were both involved with Balco, the Bay Area um, company for, uh, I think it's Bay Area Longevity Company, where they were creating the designer steroids that Canseco, McGuire, and many other players used at this time. In addition to steroid use in this era, you have smaller, much smaller ballparks being introduced, like the one in Baltimore, Camden Yards. Um, interestingly, in 1994, labor strife struck again, leading to the player strike that canceled the World Series. Baseball popularity took a hit in this two-year two stretch between 1994 and 95. And because of that, many people point to this as the reason why offensive st statistics really exploded after this. Because when the strike ended, the owners wanted more offense again, and particularly home runs. So many people believe that the owners looked the other way when it came to steroid use and even encouraged the league to create a ball that was more tightly wound called the juiced ball. So you have juiced baseballs, juiced players, and smaller ballparks. You want to talk about a recipe for offense and home runs, well there you have it, okay? So in 1998, as I said earlier, McGuire and Sosa break Roger Maris's home run record. They both broke the record that season, okay? McGuire finished ahead with 70 home runs. And then just three years later, Barry Bonds breaks the record for the third time in three years, hitting 73 home runs. In 2007, Bonds breaks Hank Aaron's all-time home run record. I believe it's 763 that he finished with. So these were important changes that obviously led to various statistical anomalies during that period. Well, now we're in the post-steroid era, 2008 to the present. And we have Mr. Mackey here saying drugs bad. Uh, Baseball really starts cracking down on steroid use and drug use, started by the Mitchell Report in 2007, which identified players that had been linked to steroids. Drug testing and drug penalties get more intense during this era, and you see a dramatic reduction in offensive statistics in this era. Pitchers are coming back to dominate more. Pitcher-friendly parks are also being introduced. Some of the newer ballparks, like City Field, um, pitcher-friendly parks. Okay, and one statistic that I think highlights this better than any else, in the steroid era, you had essentially 2.9 no-hitters thrown per season, okay? That jumps to 6.14 no-hitters thrown per season in the post-steroid era. It seems like, you know, every other week a pitcher these days is throwing a no-hitter. And here I have Max Scherzer who threw new, two no-hitters this past season, one against the Mets on the last day of the season. So very quickly, we calculated a lot of statistics in the book. We looked at the four main pitching statistics, one of which being a sabermetric statistics whip. And we looked at four significant offensive statistics, the last one being a sabermetric statistic here, OPS. Uh, we didn't calculate every, we didn't calculate a z-score for every single statistic, for every single player, for every single year. That was uh, a little bit bigger, um, enterprise than what we were able to do. But we looked at, in each era, who led each of these categories, and we calculated z-scores for those performances for category leaders in each era. And so there are a lot of results that we report on. In the talk today, I just want to check where I'm at on time. Okay. 
In the talk today, I'm just going to focus on a couple of the most important. So home runs are what everybody uh, can relate to. So who's, which single season home run total yielded the highest z-score in our analysis? So we have Barry Bonds, who holds the current single season record of 30, uh, 73 home runs. We have Roger Maris, who held one of the previous records, 61 home runs set in 1961. We have Babe Ruth with 60 home runs set in 1927. So how many people would vote A? Nobody. How many people would vote B? How many people would vote C? Anybody voting D? A couple of people. OK, well, the answer? Well, it's D, none of the above. So none of these home run totals were the highest z-score for home runs that we computed. However, the winner is Babe Ruth, but not when he hit 60 home runs for the Yankees in 1927, when he hit 29 home runs in 1919 for the Red Sox. Not only was this the highest z-score for home runs that we calculated, this was the highest z-score for any baseball statistic that we calculated. So you may be asking, well, how could 29 home runs be more significant than 60 home runs and 61 home runs and 73 home runs? Well, we go back to Mr. Goodgrade and Mr. Hardnose's class. So if you go to the next slide, the year that Babe Ruth hit 29 home runs in 1919, the league average for home runs was only 3.47. Remember, this is in the heart of the dead ball era, where we had big ballparks, we had dead baseballs, we had um, players obviously weren't on steroids, many other factors, right? Look at this ballpark here. I mean, this is like 600 feet. This is the old Yankee Stadium. Oh, no, it's the Polo Grounds. I'm sorry, it's the Polo Grounds. So, I mean, this, this is tremendous. Um, the pitcher's mounds were also taller than they are now. So when you hit nearly 10 times the league average, that's how you end up with a z-score that is much more impressive than even Barry Bonds hitting 73 home runs. If we were to calculate what Babe Ruth's z-score would equate to, if he hit the same number, if he achieved the z-score for home runs in 2001 when Barry Bonds hit 73 home runs, that z-score of 5.70 would translate to 107 home runs in 2001. So that's how impressive 29 home runs in 1919 actually is. It would be equivalent to 107 home runs in 2001. In addition to Babe Ruth, Pedro Martinez is another hero of our book. Pedro Martinez was on the pitching side during the steroid era. And he, he accumulated statistics that would be amazing in any era. But when you consider that he put up statistics like 313 strikeouts, 0.74 whip, 1.74 ERA, when you consider that he put up these statistics in the heart of the most offensively dominated era in baseball history, it's mind boggling, which is why I believe that Pedro Martinez is perhaps the greatest pitcher of all time. Now, it's interesting. We believe that Pedro Martinez got robbed twice for the MVP award. And one of the other advantages to using a statistic like a z-score to reevaluate baseball statistics is now, for the first time, we can directly compare pitching performance with hitting performance. We can directly compare Pedro Martinez's wins, ERA, strikeouts, and whip to a hitter, in this case, Ivan Rodriguez's batting average, home runs, RBI, and OPS, because they're both converted to the same metric, the metric of the z-score. In 1999, Ivan Rodriguez won the MVP award, but what we demonstrate here is Pedro Martinez's z-scores for the pitching categories that he led was much more impressive than Ivan's Rodri Ivan Rodriguez's z-scores for the hitting categories that he led. Pedro Martinez had the highest single z-score, 4.25 for strikeouts. He had the, the, the highest average z-score ac across categories. And he had the highest median z-score across categories, 2.94. The following year, history repeated itself. We believe Pedro Martinez got robbed again, this time by Jason Giambi. In this case, Pedro Martinez again had the highest single z-score for a statistic for ERA, 1.74. He also had the highest average z-score across categories and the highest median z-score across categories. Well, as George Santayana famously said, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. 
And I believe this year history repeated itself with Jake Arrieta getting robbed of the MVP award. Bryce Harper had an outstanding season, and as you can see, he had the highest single Z-score that we calculated for the season. But when you look at average Z-score across categories and median Z-score across categories, across the board, Jake Arrieta, we believe, had a more impressive season relative to his pitchers, who were the National League pitchers of 2015, in contrast to Bryce Harper's peers, the National League hitters of 2015. So again, this is what one of the great benefits of Z-scores is. You can now compare apples to oranges. Well, we have Schopenhauer here talking about honor and fame. And the reason why I have this here is because I, I believe that one of the best applications for Z-scores is to better evaluate players for the Hall of Fame. And in a few months, uh, in June, I'm hoping to be fortunate enough to present my data to the Hall of Fame at a convention sponsored by the, the Hall of Fame uh, in Cooperstown. There are many different ways that we could evaluate baseball statistics, particularly people in the steroid era for the Hall of Fame. The easiest method that I came upon is what I'm calling the Mensa method. So if we identify a performance that is outstanding in some endeavor of life, in this case IQ, and we find the z-score associated with that great performance, in this case a z-score of 2.0, maybe we can use that as a standard for how to, how, you, how to evaluate baseball performance from era to era. So, Quite simply, in an oversimplified way, perhaps we could consider a person of having a Hall of Fame worthy season if that player had a z-score of 2.0 for some offensive or pitching category for that particular season. And perhaps, you know, if a player has seven seasons in the course of their career in which they have a z-score of 2.0 or higher in some particular category, we would consider that player a Hall of Fame. So, when we're talking about our work here in this book, if the, another reason why I think this work is so important is not just so we can figure out who belongs in the Hall of Fame in baseball, but because I think it's important, as the uh, woman's question alluded to earlier, that there are different ways of evaluating performance in terms of absolute-based performance or criterion-level performance, as well as relative performance. And in life, what I've learned as a psychologist, as a clinical psychologist, is that the people that come to me tend to base their self-esteem and happiness, not in terms of absolute levels of success or performance, but relative levels of success relative to their closest peers. And I'm going to talk about two people real quick. Uh, they, I've given them pseudo pseudonyms, Omar and Lena. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what makes uh, them unique. So uh, in, in here, I'm, I'm talking about Omar as Gulliver and Lilliput. For those of you who remember Gulliver's travels, Gulliver remains the same size throughout the book, and he travels to different lands. In one land, the people, the Lilliputians, the people of Lilliput are about six inches tall, and Gulliver feels like a giant. Uh, he then travels to Brobdignag, and the people are much bigger. Uh, I think they're about two and a half times the size of Gulliver, and he feels like a little garden gnome. Okay, Gulliver remains the same size though throughout the book. So the reason why I bring this up, so I have one patient, we'll call him Omar, who is on social services. He makes less than twenty thousand dollars a year, and he lives a lifestyle in a rent in a Section Eight uh, apartment. He lives a lifestyle that most of us would never trade places with. But Omar is one of the happiest and most optimistic patients that I work with. Why is that? How could someone making $20,000 a year living in Section 8 housing be so happy and optimistic? Well, because Omar isn't comparing himself to the rest of the world. Omar is comparing himself to his closest peers, many of whom are either in jail or are dead or have less than he does. Now, in contrast to Omar, we have Lena, who is an adolescent patient that I see. And Lena is someone who, in absolute terms, is very fortunate. She has a family with assets up to $5 million, which sounds extremely impressive and, and, and truly is. But Lena, in her wealthy hamlet, is actually at the lower end of the income scale, believe it or not. That's a pretty wealthy hamlet, right? And so in her upper crust neighborhood, $5 million doesn't get you uh, a lot, at least according to her standards. 
Her $350 coach book, which most people would consider uh, extravagant, is inferior to the $1,000 Louis Vuitton bags that all of her teenage friends have. So this is, uh, th all of this has contributed to Lena having a uh, poor self-image and low self-esteem. Essentially, both Omar and Lena are not looking at their absolute level of worth. They are comparing themselves to their closest peers. Future directions. Um, so, as I said earlier, um, we are hoping to present these data to the Hall of Fame in June. Uh, we have a few other talks lined up. We're hoping to have the book be picked up by uh, several uh, schools, universities, and sports management programs, even statistics or psychology related programs. And we're really hoping to create a revolution in the way that people evaluate performance. Yes, absolute performance and criterion based performance is important. But we believe that relative performance is also, is also very important because on a fundamental level, we seem to think of ourselves more in terms of our relative performance in life than our absolute performance. So I'd just like to acknowledge a few people uh, that are not here today. Um, these are some of the statistics consultants that I had. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody knows who they are. Some people at Stony Brook, I'm not sure if Mike Sakuma is here or not. Uh, you might know some of these people. But here at Dowling, I'd first like to acknowledge and thank Brian Stippelman, who um, was gracious enough to invite me to be here, the Dean of Arts and Sciences. Mike Sakuma, Bill Indick, and Marcus Tai in the Psychology Department, who helped to facilitate me talking here today. And of course, last but not least, Cynthia Grossman, who did so much to make this happen and invited uh, Elizabeth Youth to be with us today. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, last but not least, I'm sorry. I would, of course, love to thank my wife, who, Lisa, who helped me so much with the presentation and the book and doing so many things, even doing the PowerPoint today. And my father, Joseph, who's here, who uh, helped out with a number of different things in the today, of course, video recording. So thank you to both of them. Okay, any questions? Yes. Oh. Yes? No? Yeah, okay. No, I, I was just wondering, have you applied the Z-score to any other sports? Excellent question, yes. Um, you want, yeah, go to the slide. I, I cut a number of slides out of the presentation for the sake of time. So I looked at, I did a, a more cursory overview of some of the other sports. And what I found was that as impressive, oh, there you go. No, next one. There you go. Uh, what I found is that Wayne Gretzky's performances, particularly uh, his performance for assists in 1985-86, actually yielded the highest Z-score of any statistic in any sport that we calculated. And we, we talk about that in this book. But you could see here some of the other statistics and their Z-scores. So Babe Ruth is right over here. Babe Ruth finished fifth in our analysis. But this is not a comprehensive, <coughs> comprehensive list. But that's the beauty of Z-scores now, right? Because now you, it's not just comparing apples to oranges in baseball, pitching statistics to hitting statistics, but now you can compare apples to oranges across all other sports, which is really incredible. Excellent question. Yeah? I don't know if you know this offhand, but what was Dale Murphy's uh, Z-score? Oh, for 1984? I would guess it was probably about 0.89 or so. Something like that. <laughs> yeah? So, uh, well, with this, uh, so Wayne Gretzky, you have the top, but he plays in a very low scoring game. So the D scores uh, would, would be very much affected by each goal, as opposed to a high score game, like the NBA, basketball in the NBA. So, uh, is there any way to even out that in terms of D scores, uh, uh, the effect of uh, the individual score with each game? So, well, here's the thing is that. Well, you're exactly right, and that's why his z-score is so impressive, right? The are you familiar with the standard deviation? Do you know a little bit about what that means? So standard deviation tells you how spread a sco scores are in a particular data set. So two distributions can have the same mean and very different standard deviations. So I'll give you an example, okay? Um, 
an exam can have, uh, two exams can have the same mean of 70, okay? But in one case, that mean is yielded by students, half the class getting an 80, and the other half of the class getting a uh, 60, so a very small range. In another class, it could have the same mean of a 70, but in this case, you have the full range from 0 to 100. So the standard deviation sort of sets the context of how a score is evaluated. Each person, their z-score is created using the standard deviation. So because of that, and because players who played in the same season as Wayne Gretzky uh, would have probably the same chance of acquiring goals and assists as he had. So if most of the league is down here, well, there's a reason for that, because it was really hard to score, which makes the fact that Wayne Gretzky scored so much the evidence that he was even that much more impressive because everybody's over here and he's over here. So that just shows how impressive his performance actually is. Yeah. Were there any, in baseball or in any sport, were there any people that you looked at, uh, famous players, Hall of Fame players, who you discovered based on uh, their Z-scores are probably overrated? Did, well, you, you would say their work performances were probably overrated, yes. right? Yeah. So one of the things that I talk about in the book, um, Bob Gibson, Bob Gibson is, is well known for uh, his 1968 season where he had, I believe, a 1.12 ERA. And that was the year of the pitcher. And, and when broadcasters talk about his performance during that season, that's always sort of held as the gold standard for pitching performance. And Sandy Koufax during that era as well. But remember that that was an era of pitching dominance where pitching mounds were much higher and all of the pitchers were dominating in that era. Ballparks were much bigger and so when I looked at his z-score uh, for his statistics in that season they weren't nearly as impressive as well Pedro Martinez's were. They were still good but all of the pitchers, almost all of the pitchers were dominating in that era in 1968 because of the factors that I've mentioned before. Yes? First of all, I take exception with you, your uh, view of Pedro Martinez is the best. As a Yankee <laughs> fan? <laughs> As a Yankee fan. Um, how about, but going off that, how about, uh, have you looked at any, any of these uh, from, say, the last three or four years, uh, people that keep coming up in the voting don't quite make, like uh, Mike Piazza, right. for example, that seem to never quite get there. And there might be other factors that are impacting whether it gets into the Hall of Fame right. or not. But if you look at some of those... That's going to be the... That's, I should have talked about that in future directions because that's really the next wave of where I, I would like to go with this. Because everybody knows that the offensive statistics in the steroid era were inflated. But how inflated? Because if they were inflated for everybody, then there should still be a context to figure out which performances were much more impressive than the rest of the group. So when we talk to the Hall of Fame and people with the Hall of Fame, that's something that we're going to want to, you know, talk about. That's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's another great point. Excellent point. Okay. So in a few years ago, Jose Canseco wrote a book, controversial book. Some people believe his estimates. Some people don't. He estimated that about 80% of the players during the steroid era were taking steroids. Okay. Um, so you say, okay, even if it's, you know, not 80%, uh, it's still a lot. It's probably more than, you know, 50%. Um, but, you know, how could, you know, how, how could we know who's taking steroids, who isn't, right? So what this does, though, when you have a situation where you have some people taking steroids and some people don't, you're right, there is a little bit of an element of unfairness here. However, it's unfairness sort of on the conservative side because it would make, what happens when you, you have, in this case, some people using steroids and some people don't, you're gonna have a larger standard deviation, okay? And you're gonna have a larger range of scores. When you have that, if we, I don't know if you can go back to the slide where we talk about the calculation of the z-score. The standard deviation is the denominator of the quotient. When the denominator of the quotient is bigger, then the quotient itself is smaller, all other things being equal. So because some were using, some weren't using, 
yes, that would make it a little bit more unfair for players of the steroid era, but right now, nobody's willing to consider their statistics at all. So better for us to be more conservative in evaluating their statistics because there's larger standard deviation than, yeah. Well, yeah, you know, again, that would, making that estimate wouldn't affect the actual calculations, though. But, yeah, I mean, in our head, we could say theoretically, yeah, let's say 50%. But if none of the players were using it or all of the players were using it, you would see a smaller standard deviation. And because of that, the z-scores would be, you know, greater. And the, my logic is that whoever wrote the book, if he was a user, he would tend to... Conseco, yeah. Exactly, and he was, right, yes, exactly, that's exactly it. So many people think he made an overestimate. And just to respond to Suzanne, uh, it, in, in this sense, the z-score is actually a much fairer statistic because the only statistics that take variation of the account, none of the other statistics take variation. That's right, that's right, that's absolutely right. Did you compute uh, Walt Chamberlain's yes. 50 point, 50 point Yes. I was stunned, I, you know, I couldn't believe, go back. I, I was stunned that that didn't have a higher z-score than it actually did. Wilt Chamberlain in basketball averaged 50 points a game. Average. Today, if someone scores 50 points a game, 50, 50 points in one game, it's national news. He averaged 50 points a game. It was uh, Wayne, the one. Yeah, there you go. So Wilt Chamberlain. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, why I asked. Not yeah, he wasn't even here. He, you know, I, I have. Um, go, go to the next one. He's on the 11 to 20. Let's see. Oh, it's, one of those slides there, but yeah, he was he was in our top 20, uh, but not in the top 10 because I was very surprised. Uh, it was two things. It was yeah, the larger standard deviation, you know, for the group, and the fact that you know, believe it or not, players played like the whole game in that era, you know. So um, scoring point totals were higher in many cases across the league than they are now. So yeah, that's a great point. 50 points a game, right? That's amazing. Did you do it sport by sport as well? I did, but I did the other. I did the other sports to a much more abbreviated level. But yeah. Oh, you're Mike Bossy fan, an Islander fan? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. All right. So yeah. So you're gonna you're gonna quibble with Wayne Gretzky, I know, as an Islander fan. Sure. Yeah. Do you use any subjectiveness in this, or is it all just raw data? Like, do you think the pitcher maybe shouldn't win MVP, or the guy from a last place team shouldn't? That's a great, yeah, that's a great argument, right? So when we're talking about who should win the MVP, there are lots of subjective arguments. So some people believe that a pitcher should not win an MVP because there's already an award for the best pitcher, the Cy Young. And the argument that we're making here is that if you want to give pitchers the MVP, then this is the statistic that you should look at. This is the empirical way that you should make that evaluation. But whether or not you should give the pitcher the MVP, obviously that's a theoretical question that data is not going to answer. What about a guy from a last place team? Guy from the same thing, right? Guy from a last place team. Um, these, uh, what, what, sort of, what sort of weight do you give things like intangibles, right? Someone like Derek Jeter, who never really led the, I think one year he led the league in, in hitting, but besides that, never really led the league in any statistical category, but is, is going to be a Hall of Famer because he always came through in the clutch. He had all of these intangibles. So how do you weigh intangibles? Well, whether you're talking about winning the MVP or getting elected to the Hall of Fame, a z-score is not going to answer that question because z-scores are just empirical and quantitative. So, yeah. So the other thought I had was with Michael Strahan, he probably averaged less than two sacks a game. I don't know what it was exactly. But a goal for Gretzky, like a goal in hockey, is a big thing. Right. And a sack could be like third and 20 and be meaningless. Right. Well, same thing with a goal. Look, in hockey, you can have empty net goals well, when there's no goalie. So it, it can kind of go both ways. But you, you assume that every other player has the same chance to get a sack. Every other player in the league has oh, a chance to get an empty net goal. Oh, I should be there, but should be above these other guys. Well, again, you know, we're looking at Michael Strahan's total relative to the league mean, okay? So, on average, players, you know, were only sacking the quarterback 1.91 times. So, 22, you know, that's, a, that's about 11 times higher than, um, you know, the league mean here. So, that's pretty good. If it was so easy 
to get sacks in that era, then the league average would be a lot higher. Does that 1.91 include only non-zero numbers? So for example, let's say there's a defensive back that had zero. Right. Uh, that had zero sacks. Is he included when you uh, when you create? Um, you know, I, I didn't I didn't focus too much on the other sports in being as selective, but uh, I believe I had all defensive players because sometimes you can get like you could have safeties acquiring sacks, sure, right? I'm, I'm just so saying. I think for those analyses, I was prop you know because those the other sports were less the focus than baseball. Uh, my initial plan was to write a book for each of those other sports individually. Uh, depending on the success of how this book does. And if and when I do that, I'm going to be a lot more meticulous about how I evaluate the divisions, you know, for who's eligible and who's not. For baseball, though, hold on one second. For baseball, I only looked at, on the pitching side, pitchers that were eligible for the ERA title, and for hitters, hitters that were eligible for the batting title. You had to have a certain number of at bats. In that same vein. Uh, if you're looking at players that had an opportunity to catch touchdowns, right. Tom Brady had zero. Right. right. I think so I looked at wide open, receivers. But. Right. I think I looked at wide receivers separate. Yeah. Uh, wide receivers and tight ends. Right. I, I had gotten that data. Actually, I had gotten that data from um, FootballReference.com, and the way that they divided who was eligible for these things is what I used. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, just piggyback on the idea of the uh, subjective criteria mm -hmm. versus more objective criteria. Um, I think you know it, it, it sort of furthers your argument in a way in that the, the Z score itself it, it is quantitative, and I think that by uh, by as you're saying that you you've not included any of the subjective criteria, you sort of um, further eliminated any sort of confounds, which I think which is what's brilliant about the Z score method, because the Z score method is um, sort of in a way. Uh, looking out for those outliers, those mm -hmm. drastic outliers, right. which could set a whole score in different motion, you know, as you stated with the two different classroom examples. So I think the fact that you excluded qualitative criteria in favor of more quantitative criteria, I think that you're also eliminating any sort of those kinds of confounds. Like, let's say there was, I'm not a sports person, but like a, a player who, I don't know, was linked with a certain magazine and they gave kudos to some player right. or something. Oh, yeah. Something like that, you might say, well, did you know that this one was on the first one to make a, a, a cover or something? And if you include that, yeah. then you're actually diminishing your original argument was how wonderful it is to have a quantitative right. uh, um, a evaluation as a Z-score. And so, you know, just to expand on that, a lot of times when people are voting for the MVP award or who gets to the Hall of Fame, Politics plays a role because a lot of players, some players who weren't popular with the writers who vote for these awards, yes. they don't vote yes. for these players for either MVP or yeah. for the Hall of Fame. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, this is a great method. I mean, I, I, I like the theory a lot. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. What was your, uh, what performance like surprised you most in terms of it being a, an athlete or performance that you hadn't previously credited as being really exceptional? Hmm. That's a good one. You know, go to. I'm gonna have to think about that. That that's that's really good. Um, well, maybe Ted Williams hitting for. I, I did. I did the Ted Williams analysis uh, separate. Uh, Ted Williams hit 406. He was the last player to hit over 400. I believe it was uh, 1941. I'm possible. Um, his Z-score for that season was uh, much lower than I expected. I don't remember the exact number, but um, George Sisler actually won the era with batting average and Z-score for batting average for that era. Uh, he had a three point something. So I would say it, it was probably Ted Williams, his 406 batting average. <coughs> yeah? <laughs> That's right. How to lie with statistics, exactly. Look, I could talk for hours about that and, and you know, write papers about that. I, I, I've come from the world of research, even though I'm a clinician now. And we like to think that just because an endeavor is empirical, that it's objective. But as a researcher in neuroscience and um, the medical sciences, what I will tell you is that there is much more subjectivity than objectivity. And using statistics 
to tell the story that you want to tell and knowing how to use those statistics the right way. Well, look, I've had to do that as a researcher. Sometimes you're getting paid by a grant. Not that I was the lead researcher on these studies, but um, you, know, you have researchers that are being paid by drug companies or various grants to find or not find certain things. And it's very easy to use certain statistical analyses to show or to hide whatever it is that you might be looking for. It's a great point. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of classic matchups, especially in baseball, like who is greater, Ted Williams or Jordan Maggio, right. who is greater, Babe Ruth or Ty Cobb. Did you find any uh, statistics to uh, definitively answer those questions for all time? Yeah, that, that was something we were going to do a whole chapter on that. And then, you know, we decided, well, let's wait and see, you know, how this book does. And if, because these analyses take a lot of time, and we, um, wanted to save those types of comparisons for follow-up books and, and so on and so forth. But you're thinking along the same vein that my colleague Jason Merchant and I were, were thinking about. Yeah. That would give, give me something to talk about when I go up to Boston for the holiday. Right, right, right. <laughs> well, no, according to these scores, Jordan Maggio was actually better than Ted Williams. Right. Yeah. 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 Y